now, the Bram Weinstein Show on Washington's new home for sports, ESPN 630. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hey, babies. Hi, everyone. I'm going to Mexico. Hi, everyone. Stop. Viva la Ted. I'm going to Mexico. I didn't know where you were going to go with that, but there it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good for them. You Dia were telling De- me. Dia de los Wizards. Yeah, the Wizards are going to play the Heat in Mexico City uh, in early November, to November which you 2nd. just pointed out. If you went down there, you could spend Halloween mm-hmm. in Mexico City. Is Halloween a thing in Mexico? I don't know. Is it? Uh, I would assume so. I would assume so, too, but I don't know. I know it sounds like a very naive thing to say, but it may. I mean, just listen to this. Just listen. Yeah. Halloween's on a Thursday this year. Yeah. You can do Thursday there. Yeah. Then Friday is Just the first. Chill. Yeah. Second is the game. Second and second is, is also Dia de los Muertes, which is is a thing there. It is a thing. And there, it's yeah. a Saturday. Yeah. A lot of, lot of booze going that day, I'm sure. That's fun. That's a good weekend. Yeah. You can find some Wizards fans that want to take the track. <laughs> Hold on, wait, I'm just trying to see who... Of, like, when I like to circle road games you should go see, Wizards Mexico City sounds like a pretty that good one, does actually. pass the test. I was trying to see what the commander schedule looks like there, um, but I don't see it on the calendar here. Commanders would be playing at the Giants that Sunday. So, okay. Can't do it. Yeah, you can't do it. Can't do it. <laughs> I got to see what the old cap schedule looks yeah, like. For that's that. so hard. So now I know they're not playing the Knicks uh, yeah. that weekend. So I could cross that one yes, off of the. That is correct. Yes. Could go see the Wizards play the Knicks. That's not happening. Yeah, they are. Uh, we've got yeah. no basketball teams in Tampa or Cincinnati. <laughs> Suns is too early for the Cardinals. Ravens, no bad. Uh oh. I don't know if you I'm going to have a, a possibility here. You got squat. So we, well, we got a possibility of they've got a Thursday night Eagles game. So if it's Wednesday, Wizards, Sixers, somehow. Uh, do you really want to do that? That's yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I do. Right, That's right. the Josh Harris special. Oh. Are you kidding? <laughs> go see the Wizards That's play fair. the Sixers and then go see the Commanders, you know, call be, the Commanders the next day. Unfortunately, it could be the same night. They're not. Oh, yeah. They've done that before where they've done the same game in the same facilities right, so. then we got at new orleans so i guess it's possible we could get lucky wizards pelicans that's December, possible maybe possible maybe yeah and then we got at the at dallas so it's possible mavericks and then we'll have to just check the caps out but like it's not looking good for the old uh like as i like to do the double up if you get lucky and get a double up yeah. on one of these trips it's not looking good for any of that this the, year the dr- actual dream is titans uh no no they're they're home against the titans just kidding so you can't get nashville yeah well let Hockey. me check the nats real quick here who happen to be playing the marlins this weekend do they have the marlins in oh in miami over in the, miami in in the summer i think this is their second trip there so i think they've only got one more left uh, I let's think. see yeah. no the marlins are here aren't they yeah yeah, yeah. But I think they've already played one trip down there is what I'm telling you. Hold on. Let's look. Second half of the season. Let me see if I can get lucky here. Uh, they play at the Marlins. No. Nope. Nope. Uh, sept- no, they're home to the Marlins in September. Yep. Uh, yeah, no. In second half of the season, they don't play them at all to mm-hmm. this one home series. So I'm not going to get that one. Correct. Not going to get that one. We got the Jets in earlier August. So no Yankees or Mets. So that's not going to time up. Done. Done. I'm not going to get the double dip again this year. Nah. I should have pulled Wizard Sacramento no, a couple years have. ago. <laughs> Nobody would go with me. The, the looks on people's faces of how to say no to that trip was amazing. <laughs> like, what? They're like, no. Why would we want to do that? Do that. Yeah. Uh, all right, let me start with the uh, NFL news today, which is Trevor Lawrence got an outrageous contract yesterday. Um, it, you know, it is... Um, I guess, I don't know. I guess it's just the going rate for a good quarterback, but he's getting paid more than Josh Allen and Pat Mahomes is. Um, You know, and did they have to do this? Five years, $275 million, $200 million in guarantees. It ties Joe Burrow's deal as the highest paid quarterback in the NFL in terms of annual salary. Burrow, who's been hurt a lot, but has played in a Super Bowl already and has won a lot of playoff games. Uh, Jacksonville has won one with Trevor Lawrence, one of the greatest comebacks in NFL history. Al didn't care so much that night, but one of the greatest <laughs> comes back. Big celebration, Waffle House. Hey, complete it. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, and they won yeah. <laughs> and came back from down 30. But that's all right. You can ignore that part. Uh, so he gets five years, $275 million. Tua and Dak are like, booyah, watching that, yep. because I think he's in their category, a little bit younger than Dak at this point. But same kind of trajectory of he's good, hasn't won really that much, and all of a sudden they're going, we definitely don't have anybody better than him. 
And so they are buy they are paying the premium price for a stock that may not hit that price. Correct. So I guess it's just what it costs to do business in the NFL if you want him because somebody would give him a massive contract, but I don't know that they would give him this. Right. It's hard to know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, my joke here is Jag on the Jags. I think Lawrence is just a guy. Like, is he good? I'm not sure. Is he I, good? I think yes. Is he been great? He's, he's definitely moments. not been great. He's had moments, but no. nothing that points to me. Like, There's he's, no great so far. Right. So I mean, far. that comeback. He's got the look, the feel, the athleticism to be that. It right. just ha- And his, you know, college and high school career was outrageous. Yeah. So if that ever sparks up again, then I guess it's possible, but they're betting on that happening. When, if he shows up to training camp next month with his hair cut off, I will put money on him winning MVP. Mm. I don't think he's ever cutting that hair off. Well, he's never going to, he's never going to get Why? There. I told you this. It's your it's your theory with coaches in the Super Bowl trophy. I think quarterbacks have to have a certain look, a professional look, to be the leader of a football team. Pat Mahomes got an interesting hair and sunglass yeah, but routine he, but that he, he goes with. But he keeps with. it clean. He keeps it clean. That's true. Where's the headband? And a lot of kids Looks now fine. go with that hair look because of him. I mean, Correct. obviously. Correct. Like, he's a trendsetter now because but he's so Trev, good. Mm, no, not, not buying it. And you When know, he shows up with the buzz cut, I will put all of my money into the table of him winning MVP. The interesting part was, so they were off of the, okay, let, let's call his rookie year just a terrible situation with Urban. Sure. Okay? 100%. I am willi- I'm willing to just go, you know what? That was a really rough situation to go into. Sure. They wisely got out of it mm-hmm. very quickly. Yep. And they went and got a professional coach there who had won a Super Bowl before yes. and had done it on offense. And it worked. They spent a lot of money in the offseason, mm-hmm. and everybody made fun of them. Remember, they got Christian Kirk and Brandon Sheriff and a couple of others, a Lua Khan, a couple of others. They spent a ton of money. Yeah. And... They got good fast. They won their division. They won a playoff game. They were competitive the following week. Yep. And then last year with Houston, I don't think everyone knew how good Stroud would be, but still, like, they're so young, no one expected what they did. Indianapolis in a reset rookie quarterback and Tennessee in a transitional year, that was supposed to be a chalk run to at least a division title for them and then see what happens when they get to the playoffs. And they weren't able to do that. And even off of that, they gave him one of the highest contracts in the history of the NFL. That's an interesting choice. Good to luck make with that. Because here's Miami and Dallas slow rolling it with quarterbacks that I would say have put up better stats than him. Slow rolling it, not wanting to give them that because they have an expectation of a different result. So I'm kind of... I guess they feel like they just can't do better than him and that there is a possibility that he will get elite good, right. even though he hasn't shown it yet. Sure. That he could, and, and the skill set's there. It's all right there for it to happen. They were saying all these things like he's become a vocal leader and he's a really important part of this whole thing, and I don't know how switching gears at this point makes sense to me. But why do you have to advance in advance give it to him? If you were going to give him this, yes. why not wait it out a year? Because the number is not going to go any higher than it actually is because Mahomes already redid his deal. Burrow already got his mm-hmm. deal. Lamar already got his deal. Herbert already got his yeah. deal. There's nobody else in line to reset it for this year. So I think they did not have to preemptively do this. I think they could have waited out the year. They still have the franchise tag that they could use with him. And see what happens. But instead, they appeased him early, which I'm not really totally sure I get. In the cutthroat world of the NFL, where it is show me when you're going to get this kind of contract, he hasn't shown them yet, but they did it anyway. Right. Preemptively, when they control his rights. So I'm a little surprised by that. With solid talent around him, too. And there's no threat Right now, yes. in the here and yeah, now, yeah. that he's going to get jumped in a number mm-hmm. because there is nobody else currently that stands to get another contract like this. He also wasn't, nobody. We also didn't hear about any whispers of him holding out. No, like he was actually going to be a good soldier. You know what? All of it. <laughs> I, I think, well, maybe maybe they'd been talking to him the whole time, and that's maybe. why he just got quiet. Okay. You right. know, I, I, I've been kind of like the two of things gotten real quiet too. Yeah. And now that this has happened, boy, his agents are armed. Yeah. Because his numbers are better. Right. 
Correct. His numbers well, are better. Well, that's the same thing with Dak now, too. Dak's like, thank you very much. I'm yeah. getting more than you now. I've proven way more than you have. Dak's like, I was almost the MVP last year. Right. We won 12 <laughs> games. Right? right. You can blame me for the playoffs you took, if you really you want away, to. You took away pieces last year, too. Yeah. And he's like, I've been in the playoffs a lot of times, guys. Mm, right. You know, a lot of times. So Dak and two are like, booyah. Correct. Yeah. yeah I think that it like sometimes these things happen preemptively to try to beat the market. In this case, the market's already where it is, and there isn't anybody else of this stature that's literally up right now. Like, this isn't last year with Lamar, where we're going, you're going to have to pay him, guys. Yeah, like, you, right. you got to do it. Yep. And in Lamar's case, he'd been an MVP, <laughs> is in the playoffs every year, posts outrageous numbers. Yep. Like, I don't know how you can't pay him. Even if you don't think he's the end-all, be-all, and you don't want to pay him, I don't know how you can't. In this case, I think Jacksonville probably should have waited one more year just to see, and even, like, they could have gone the golf route with him and been like, okay, we'll give you something a little lower, but they've determined they're going to pay him like he's a top two or three quarterback, and he'll get surpassed, but not anytime soon. That's why I don't really understand it yeah. today. I don't understand why they – I don't understand the thinking behind that today. There was no rush. Like No, that, there that's, wasn't. That, that's, like, what I think I'm – kind of wrestling with more when I saw that yesterday because it was also very random timing. I mean, yeah, I get it. You can't time these things like well or whatever. But that was my first thinking was, wow, that's a lot of money for a quarterback that's done what he's done. And I get it. Number one overall pick. And we've seen number one overall picks develop and become great, great. I just haven't seen it from him. And in fact, you and I were talking about it last year in the second half of like, are they going to give like they're going to give him the fifth year option, but Beyond that, are they actually yeah. going to want to resign him? It was a legitimate question. And the fact that you sure. have that question. You give them the fifth-year option because the number isn't so outrageously right. high. And it's actually way lower than quarterbacks. So it's worth it just to do and it. And that risk is nothing for a quarterback. No, and like, and if it doesn't go that well, you can trade him. Yes, correct. Exactly. Like he's like, there's another team that's right. waiting to go, we'll give him the yeah. second shot. No doubt about yeah, it. Yeah, like what I'm getting at here is they would have been fine to wait and they would have paid, what, five to ten million, maybe more, like at most. Maybe. At most. Like, no, I, I don't even think they would have done that. Yeah, I right. think that I think they could they could have played this out. Okay, let's just say he does have a bonkers year this year. Okay. They can give him the same contract. Yeah. Right. It's still <laughs> Burrow's contract. Yeah, what yeah. is he gonna turn it down? No, because Burrow's not up, Lamar's not up, Mahomes isn't up, Allen's not not up yeah. none of these players are up so it means nobody's getting a contract like this only he Dak and Tua and Dallas and Miami are saying out loud we kind of don't want to do that That's right we may do it but we don't want to do it and on the flip side too Miami not Dallas so much because Dallas is talented all around like they kind of rotate who's good every year in terms of their position group but Miami did surround Tua with all this talent and tried to take advantage of the rookie contract. Yes. They didn't really do that with Trevor. Like they no. signed guys, but they didn't go for like the home run. Like they didn't do what the Texans did and get digs. Like maybe, no. maybe you're only going to get a year out of them, but you still kind of went for it with him. It's funny. That Christian Kirk contract looks great. It right does. Now. No, 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 totally. But they reset it. Right. And he jump started the receiver market. Correct. And then all the better players got way more money. Yeah. So like they kind of screwed everybody <laughs> yes, else. Correct. But like now, <laughs> That contract looks amazing comparatively, but actually. Kirk, but Kirk is not the 1-1 one, one type guy that you hit the home run higher no, with. No, he's like, not. Like he's, he's, no, everybody made fun of him because they went, you're paying him like a number one receiver and everybody knows he isn't. Right. He's good. He's not that. Exactly. And as it turns out, if you've watched them, he is really good. He is really good, but he's, he's not just, that. He's not Tyreek Hill. Yes. But now he's not getting paid like Tyreek Hill. Yeah. So it actually all makes sense now. They actually That one actually worked out and looks smart right now. Now, at the time it didn't. But now it does because of everybody else getting the money that they got that jumped him. So that one looks smart. This one is a risk. Yep. It's just a risk, and it's an unnecessary one. Mm -hmm. They felt like at the time when they paid Kirk and they paid Sheriff and they paid Aluakon and they paid some other guys, I think they felt like we need to upgrade our talent. We've got all this cap room. Let's just do it yeah. and see if it works out with Lawrence, who was a 1-1. Let's just see if it works out. It did, actually. Last year... You'd have to explain to me what happened because it wasn't like a rash of injuries. It's just they didn't play all that well. And the fact that they couldn't make the playoffs in that division is very telling about mm -hmm. them. And then they turn around and double down on him and say he's a top two quarterback in terms of pay. That doesn't really jibe with reality to me unless, I, unless he becomes that. And if he does, then they're going to look semi-smart again because they're still paying him top of the market and that's not going to change. But he has to now play like top of the market, and he hasn't. So this was a 
this was one of those. This feels a little not as much Daniel Jones. I still think Trevor could be really good. Mm-hmm. I don't think Daniel Jones will be really good. Could he be a good, solid quarterback? Sure. Is he ever going to be a top five one? No. But they also didn't pay him like that. They paid him more than I think he should have gotten. Yeah. But he's not, and they're already regretting it. You can feel it. You can hear it, feel it. That's the way they're talking about it. They already regret it, and he's probably only there for one more year and may not even win the starting job. Sure. But in Lawrence's case, he's unquestioned their starter. They've determined that he's their guy. They've made him out to be a top five quarterback, but reality has not shown that at all. Right. So right. it's a weird preemptive move to do it. I don't know why they had to do it. Like, even unlike Herbert, Herbert hadn't won anything, but Herbert looks it, like totally looks it. Correct, yeah. And I think that, like, they're buying into when we get everything around him right, we're going to be great because he looks the part. Lawrence has at moments looked it, but never consistently, never. And that's why I think this is off but you know whatever I mean uh, they don't have anybody better than him that's for sure not even close I will say this the reality of the contract is interesting I just went on sport track to look at to see like what the out was because of course it's not a full contract um it's really a five-year 200 million dollar deal they want to get out of it two years early two years early and his cap hit is actually not insane for the first couple um the deal is obviously an extension. So this year it's 15 million. Next year it's 17. The following is 24. The year after that is 35. Then it jumps to 47. Yeah, but then what's the dead them. cap? The dead cap number tells you when you can actually get out of something. And uh, that's probably five years from now. Dead cap uh, goes down from 103 million next year to 66 million to 29 million to nothing the following year. So they could actually cut them before that potential out as well. So they had to have a dead cap of 29 million in three years. To yeah. get out of it. If they it. were to cut him in 2027, it'd be 29 on the dead cap. That's not that bad. Though. So that's what they did. They they actually, I they guess they gave put him a bonus. huge. They gave him a huge number. Yeah. But in reality, it's three years before they have to get out of it. Correct. So that's choose it. to get out of it. Right. And if they do want to keep him, then then he makes real money. Which I guess if he's that good by that point, whatever. If he's making the real money, then you restructure and get Correct. the number back down yeah. again. All right, so that makes a little more sense to yeah, me. Yeah, because I was still interested. just the bot. The overarching headline number was like, "You think he's the best quarterback in right. the NFL?" Yeah, right. What exactly. have you been watching? Yeah, exactly. You guys haven't won anything. <laughs> what are you talking about? He's not leading the league in stats. What are you even talking about? One thing that is interesting, um, you know, usually these contracts are have a bunch of filler numbers or whatever. His workout bonus is only half a million each year, so a lot of that money is going to be like roster bonuses and whether you hit certain things okay. in the season but he's only got half a million 29 million bonus. dead cap in in this day and age of where the cap is is not that bad so they're really right. only in this for three more years with him yep. and then at that point they'll have to make a choice and if he's doing what they think he's going to do well then they'll just restructure the contract right. give him more money it's it's actually you know it's good for him if they dead cap him out then he underperformed again yep. and then he's going to be a backup Right. Or he'll get his second chance, but everyone's no one's going to give him the crazy money because on the second chance, it's a show me. Of course. Yep, exactly. All right. Okay. It doesn't look as bad, but it's still... The top line number was like, whoa. Yeah. When so I saw it, it I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding. Like, this guy hasn't done anything to earn that yet. Basically, but okay. it boils down to a five-year, $202 million deal is really what it seems to... Including... Including this year. These two years where his cap number is actually still quite affordable because yep. he's actually on a rookie deal. Exactly. Well, maybe they maybe they wisened up on this. Maybe this isn't so bad. Like, the fine print means more than the big numbers, yes. actually, in Correct. the NFL. Unless it's all guaranteed, which in his case is not. And if right. they did do that, they're insane. Yeah. <laughs> yes, correct. So that's actually... You know what? Funny enough, that's like in line with the Jags have done. They have signed all of these guys to these types of contracts. So, all right, fine. Uh, I wonder, you know what? Like now hearing that, if I'm Tua or Dak or the Dolphins or the Cowboys, and I look at that and I go, if those numbers really don't mean that yeah, yeah. and we can get out of it after three years, well, then maybe that's a way more interesting way to look at Tua and Dak if they're willing to look at it that way. Right, exactly. And like, hey, if you play well enough. We'll extend you down the line anyways. The problem with Dak is he's already making the big money. Yeah, right. See, see, Trevor wasn't. And you have to hand him the money because his dead cap money next year and the year after is so much that, like, you have no choice but to kind of be stuck with him. Right. Different different animal. Uh, The other thing I didn't talk about was, like, the other day, which I I didn't mean to overlook, but Tom Brady's retirement night thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
That was incredible. Yeah, it was really good. That was really cool, honestly, as an event. I mean, it was like a like I felt like I was watching the Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Yeah, because it was I, incredible. Because I um, I wonder if the commanders are like, oh crap, do we got to do that for Daryl Green yeah. now? <laughs> well, Is that did they just reset how we're going to retire so, someone's number? So, now, granted, he's, he's the goat. He's the goat. Yeah. So I mean, like you had to do something special. But for the commanders, Daryl might be the goat. You know, he's like having best week ever. Like he does that thing. Stadium was basically sold out too. I don't know if you saw the pictures yes. from it. Um. And he puts on the best speech I've ever heard about. He was like, you don't have to be the best athlete. You just have to do what no one else does. I don't know if you heard that quote. He no. was like, you need to do what everyone else doesn't do. And that's be consistent, show up, like be on time. Yeah. It was very, it was like super inspirational for yes. Joe the fan over here. Right. But then you didn't, did you hear the off the field news with no. uh, your, your girl, with Who? Giselle? No. Oh, you don't know about this. Oh, I'm happy. That this is going to be up I'm, my lane. I, All right. I, I really know. Ha- oh, Tell I'm, me more. I'm so yeah. happy. You don't know about this. So Giselle, of course, was dating the jujitsu uh, right. guy, right? He uh, said that the Brady roast put so much attention and stress on him that they ended their relationship. Oh, so Brady's roast causes her to break up with the guy that allegedly broke them up, and he gets inducted into the Hall of Fame and has well, the best he thing has, ever. I didn't talk a lot about the roast. I actually didn't watch the whole thing. I just saw the clips. Yeah, so did I. Yeah. And I actually found the clips to be a little much. They were, for sure. But that's what a roast is. Like, you can't walk into that room and know that nothing's on the table. I mean, what was amazing, though, like, the the anything about him and his family and his and his personal life, totally on the table. Say anything about Bo- Robert Kraft and massages, <laughs> off the table. <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But I guess there were some jokes with him. That I'm not going to repeat on the air that, of course, because he was mentioned there and Giselle and him were, you know, you know, fair game, essentially, in this roast. Yeah. What I don't understand, though, is he, he said that it was so stressful and like it brought this all this unwanted attention. I'm like, guy, it's over. Like new cycles are done. Like, yeah. like you are so far gone. Brady admitted afterwards that it was not maybe Correct. a great mistake. Like, like he was like, it put a lot of stress on my family, and he was like, I, I wish I would have thought that through a little differently. Sure. Like, what did you think Jeff and, Ross was going to talk about? Right, and of course, and, and I totally get that. But like, the it's sports over. guys, like they don't realize, like if you're going to do something like this, they're coming at you. Yes, funny absolutely. is funny to those people. Correct, but what I nothing's off, nothing's off the board if it's funny. To what, them. But what I don't get is the news cycle is over, man. Like your most stressful part about it is over with. Like. I don't yeah, know. It's over. Nobody's For, talking about it anymore. Right. No one knows who you are anymore. Like, You're dating Giselle, dude. Right. Welcome to the big time. I mean. You're bothered by that? Honestly, though. Her you, name's going to come up periodically all the time because she's a supermodel. Also, you reap what you sow. You're dating Giselle who dated Tom Brady. Like, right. this is this is what you signed up yeah. for. And that's what put it over for you? Yeah. Like, I'd rather be a small-time jujitsu teacher again. Go ahead, buddy. I mean, we talk about sometimes built different, not built different, yeah. that guy. That guy will not be giving a speech in front of a full stadium. He folded. folded. He couldn't take it. Couldn't take the heat. You got Giselle from Tom Brady. You just wait it out, man. It'll go away. We're talking about Caitlin Clark this week, dude. (laughs) That's right. Nobody cares about that anymore. That's what I'm saying. Nobody remembers who was in it. Nobody cares. You know, the kids use the term fumble the bag. I mean, that's... Dude, you you were already clear. You scored the touchdown. You're 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 in the locker room, and you decided to end it. Uh, If you're the Patriots looking at their team heading into this year... Uh Is that the best moment of the year? Did uh, they just have it? I think they just maybe, had it. Maybe. I mean, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're not going like, to win the Super Bowl. So. In hindsight, our best moment last year was the announcement of Josh Harris and Correct. the ownership yes. group taking over. We threw a parade for that. That's right. Yes. He's buying beers for people. Everybody's going crazy. <laughs> That's right. Thank yes. you, Josh. Was the chant at training camp. <laughs> Everything else went south <laughs> from that point forward. I think you're going to look back at the 2024 season and go, the best moment of the Patriots season was a sold-out stadium celebrating the retirement of Tom Brady's number. To be fair, he's <laughs> the greatest player of all time. So, he I mean, is. like, that's not actually far-fetched, like, outside of winning a Super Bowl. So, you're saying, like, when, because we're always homecoming for people. Yes. Like, so, I okay. The Saints are doing this for Drew Brees. Yeah. I've already surmised they're picking I, us. I think I said that to you in right December, when the schedule came out. But <laughs> now that this happened... How do they not have oh. Drew Brees night? Yeah, but they could and do sell it. Like they got to look at that and go, let's rethink this, guys. He's the greatest we saint need- of all time. I mean, by oh, far, not by, close. Yeah, by far, yeah, not in every way. But you like, can still do what they did. And just- he was after Hurricane Katrina. He was like a angel down there for that community. Yeah, but you could do both. They could do a weekend. 
So you do that on Saturday because their field is turf anyways. You could do that whole event on on a Saturday night, uh, and then Sunday is the real game. I bet you you could do that. God, I, I or mean, Friday night even. I honestly thought I was watching the Hall of Fame induction ceremony when they did this. It was incredible, yeah. the thing that they put on. Did you see the Randy Moss clip? Yeah, that was awesome, too. That was amazing. Yeah, they got him sick. to cry. Yeah. Well, I mean, he didn't get a good buy from them. I mean, he was right. gone. I mean, because remember, it ended right. really weird with him. Like, he was only there for a couple of years. Yeah, you know, he, the majority of his career was not there. Sure, but he was the best wide receiver Brady ever had. Oh, yeah. By far. Oh, yeah. And he was on the 16 and 0 yes, team. Yes, right. They right. were unreal together. They were unreal. I forget if he got traded, too. He might have gotten traded. I don't remember. Because he went to the Titans after them, I think. I don't so even I think, remember. I, I feel like he I think he might have gotten traded. I think it was a bill. He had thing. unbelievable run in Minnesota, and then things went south, and then he went <laughs> the to the Raiders. Raiders. He didn't try. <laughs> yeah. He right, didn't try. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and then he ended up going to the Patriots and found out he was Randy Moss still. That's right. And became great Hall of Fame receiver Randy Moss again. And then they near missed the Super Bowl. Their right. best mm. team of the whole dynasty, didn't their best it. team yeah. didn't win it. Right. Which is crazy. I'm trying to find um Oh, he was a free agent. He was a free agent in 2008, and then he signed on with um, with Tennessee. Uh, oh was? no, no, he resi- he signed on with the Patriots, and then after that, he signed on again in 09. Oh, so he played in there 10. But then he went back to the Vikings. Oh, he did. He went to back to the Vikings. There, I don't even remember. No, that. he went to the Vikings, then went to the Titans. Hmm. So he yeah. wanted to go back to try to. Hey, man, I forgot about all this. He went to the Vikings again for a second stint. Then went to the Titans, then retired and came back and played for the 49ers. I remember none of that. I can't believe I remember none of that. I want a Randy Moss 49ers jersey. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, but either way, I mean, that was, you know, that was a really cool clip. Um, I mean, I, I, I have to think, though, other teams around the league in seeing this have got to think about this a little differently because it's always just been like a halftime ceremony or something. Sure. But after seeing what they had and sold out their stadium, they must be rethinking a, this. There, that was incredible. There is a difference here, though, because one, he's the GOAT. Two, I'm sure you had fans clamoring for it, and NFL teams have never shied away from money. Like I even, think they wanted the proper goodbye to him, too. That was another weird correct. thing. Like and, The and, way it ended, it should have never... He, he should have played his whole like, career there. Of course he should have played his whole career but there. Like, you've been around this Washington franchise long enough. Even though it was Snyder, Like there were a lot of banquets and luncheons and stuff that yeah. were honoring some of these guys. Of not, course. Not like that, but like... We had a huge... Stuff kind of one, behind the scenes. What was it? The 75th anniversary. Yeah, we did a right. giant event. Yeah, exactly. That I went to. So I'm, I'm just like, yeah. I, I think what just happened here is this was just at the stadium, and I'm sure so many people were like, let us buy tickets to this. And yeah. they probably, you know, charged a couple bucks. But then, I, the only one I can think of now is they're retiring Breeze's number. I think yeah. you kind of have to, if you're New Orleans, if you were just going to do the typical halftime thing yeah. at whatever game, I think you need to I think you do both. that now. I think you do yeah. both, though. It's time to have Drew Brees night there. And then, but then you still raise the number at halftime or pregame, yeah. whichever you decide to do. Yeah. Yeah, I Because so. that, that crowd, that crowd you want to, uh, you know, cheering that on beforehand. Mm-hmm. All right, we'll be right back. Brand Watch the Show, ESPN 630 Sports Capital. Uh, Casey Kruger from The Spirit's going to join us in about 15 minutes uh, to get set for what might be a record crowd tomorrow at Audi Field. Um, I think they're expecting 17,000 currently, something like that. The number this morning was this. Hold, please. I, I had it here. Um, this was from Stephen Goff, of course, who uh, writes for the Washington Post with soccer. He said this morning at around 930, they have already surpassed 17.5. That's great. And that would be the second largest home crowd. That place only holds, I shouldn't say only, that place holds 20. So, okay, so there's a chance of a sellout. I tomorrow. think it will. I mean, okay, I, so I there's a chance at a sellout tomorrow. Weather's supposed to be nice. Yes. Alex Morgan is here. Yep. San Diego won the Shield last year, did not win the championship. Yep. Very good team. Record is deceiving if you look at it. And I'm a little concerned about oh, the okay. Spirits uh, winning streak as Got I've it. been kind of prepping for the match this weekend. But I'm excited to see a massive crowd this weekend for what will be a great match between the Spirit and the Wave tomorrow night. Weather tomorrow, 82 at 6 o'clock. It's going to yeah. drop to 75 around game time. Okay. I mean, that's so it's going to be warm. That's going to be that's and it's be humid fun here. atmosphere. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be warm. So yeah. it should be really fun really tomorrow fun. night. You'll we'll hear from her. John Kime will join us at 4 o'clock. It'll be the last time I bother him until training camp starts. Yeah. You can do the doubleheader tomorrow. The Nats play the Marlins at 4. Oh. You could do that. So you could make it. You could and easily. just walk right over. Easily. Yeah, walk right <laughs> like have, over. Have enough time yeah. to go grab a bite or something. So the old double a, header. That's a nice double header. Uh, uh, yeah, tomorrow. see, Kime at 4 o'clock. Uh, last time I'll bug him for six weeks as we uh, wrap up <laughs> mini camp. We've got a lot to talk about. When he goes about. on his darkness retreat. Is that yeah. what Kime's doing for six weeks? I'm going to ask him about this. Did you see the clip where they showed Adam Peters like doing the trade with Harry Rosa? Yeah. Like you're a pain in the ass. You're a pain in the ass. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. It's awesome. You're a pain in the ass. <laughs> it's good. Where was Ron's calls with trades? With trades? 
No, those didn't exist. Well, he did a big one. They traded down <laughs> they when did. Olave went to the Saints. We, didn't get, and we, we could, didn't get audio of it. We didn't get any audio of it. I'd like to hear who made the call. Guys, guys, guys. <laughs> yeah. I, I would pay to hear that one. I would like to hear that one. <laughs> Uh, Dan Hurley is doing a lot of interviews now yeah. to clarify his position that, you know, he was not leveraging UConn with the Lakers. Yep. Uh, let's see. This one from CBS Sports where they just did a transcript of the interview. Which I thought was did. good. I was I, like, I no too. reports, no, like, we had a discussion. No, no here's, here's the whole entire thing. Uh, let's see. They asked initially, what was your reaction when your agent called you last Monday and says the Lakers thing is real? He goes, how did it land with you? And he said, because it's the Lakers, it landed differently. If your whole life has been basketball and the L.A. Lakers call, it's an exciting moment. Your imagination goes wild because if you're a historian and you love the game, all your memories of a child of watching it, thinking about it, it's an exciting moment. Then they asked, what were your emotions when you walked into the facility? Because obviously he did meet with them. And he said this, there was some nervous energy um, in that way. I had developed a rapport with Rob Palenka over the course of a couple of days that week. There had been a pre-draft conversation about Rob, about our players. I've had good conversations with him. Remember, Jordan Hawkins was a target of theirs in the last draft, so I, I wasn't going in totally blind relative to Rob. There was a comfort level there. But meeting Jeannie Buss and the Buss family of the Lakers, that's when I kind of walked in, and she walked in, and I went, oh, bleep. bleep yeah. <laughs> what was the tenor? Were they hard-selling you? He said, I think it was for us, it was basically adapting to the things that we do at UConn from an offensive standpoint and from a defensive standpoint, from a culture and player development standpoint, and adapting that to one of the greatest franchises in all the sports, combining what we built here in terms of our basketball identity and combining that with one of the greatest brands in the world. See, this happened in college. Can you do it in the pros? Right. The Lakers tried to get Coach K, who's got an all-time great culture down at Duke and what they had built, and they tried to transfer that over. And he, 20 years ago, famously, even with Kobe Bryant in his yeah. prime, was like, I don't think so. I don't want to do this. I've never, and I'm sure he's talked about it, but I've never gotten clarity as to why he definitively did not want to do that because obviously he did coach on the international level with the United sure. States men's basketball team for a number of years. And you would think just from hubris that you'd want to try it with the biggest brand in sports, but he didn't want to do it either. Yeah. Let's see. What were you thinking when you walked out of the building, got on the plane and flew back home? He said, this is going to be brutal. And it's going to be a hard choice. And I think in general, it's weird because some of the advice and there's just all these different things, but you've got all these things going on in your mind. But it's funny in the end because I had a conversation with Alex Caravan who's one of his UConn players. Mm -hmm. He said, if a decision is really hard, whether you should stay in a place or leave a place and you're torn, you probably should never go. You should only probably leave a place if it's a clear thing to do. And so really, I just backtracked and did uh, just that and what I told Alex. I mean, they're winning a lot. He's coach for life there if he wants to be. He's got it good. Um, you know, I don't think this means that they definitively continue to win championships because it's a one-and-done tournament. Sure. So even right. if they're great every year, it's a one upset away. Right. Or even on a down-ish year where you're a six seed, it's one loss to an even better team and you're out. So this doesn't mean you keep winning, winning, winning. But they do have a good thing going there. And whatever they're doing, they've figured out NIL, at least yeah. in the interim, for sure. Yeah, I mean, he, he says they're, you know, pretty much saying you try to survive right now this climate in college, and he has. He's yes. not only that, he's thrived. So I think he's what he's also getting at, too, is on the other side, he thinks he's going to be just fine as well once all of this kind of settles down. Because we, yeah, we, are, we are waiting for the reckoning here. Like, it's not going to stay like this forever, most likely. Yes. Uh, let's see. Did they ask about LeBron? I want to see they if they did. asked they about did. LeBron. So, you want to, I can, I can tr you know you know, um, just give you like a synopsis. He said he texted with LeBron. He did. He, he said he texted with him, had a little bit of a relationship. He literally said, I'd be dumb not to text him because of his of course. status. Um, and he said he seemed perfectly fine. Um, and that was pretty much it. He yeah, said he had, they, they had some back and forth. It's a CBS ask with your coaching ability, but also your ego. Did the prospect of potentially coaching LeBron James heavily tempt you? And did you talk to him at any point? He said, that was one of the pluses. It was one of the draws. It was the chance in your lifetime to have coached one of the greatest players of all time. I have a lot of confidence that my work ethic and my expertise and my ability to connect with him would have made for a great partnership. And it was a huge draw for me. We texted some, and I'm smart enough to have had some conversations there because you would want to, obviously, begin that relationship where you know that he's got sons that are really good at basketball if I was going to stay in college. Yep, yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, only time will tell if he did the right thing. And it's hard to turn down. I've heard some people, I think Shannon Sharp said something to the effect of they didn't make the money right. But six years, 70 I don't million think the money sounds... Any, I don't think the money had anything to do with it. 
I think he was, I think Shannon Sharp was trying to say, make it so overwhelming that he right. just literally can't turn it down sure. because like, obviously they're offering him more than what UConn was probably offering him. But if you make it so much more that it's like, how in the world could you walk away from this? Yeah. And I think that's what his point was. And I don't know what he's making at UConn, but I'm sure it's not 70 million. I'm right. sure he got a bump. He did, again, go out of his way to say I was not trying to leverage yes, UConn in right. all of this. There's a lot in that article, though, in that interview, though, where I thought I think it was worth just mentioning. He said his fan interactions, not to say that it was the defining thing, but he had all these little interactions with fans that I think influenced him. Like he said he was out in California and there were people like taking pictures of him eating dinner. Being like, oh, yeah. like go, like doing like the walk by, like, oh, go Lakers, like you're sticking around. And then he said he would run into someone from UConn and be like, I'm here for a wedding. What are you doing yeah, here? Yeah. And then there was another one where he said he met a friend because there's this whole story about him going to a Billy Joel concert. That's also really good, but it's just too long. He met a friend and the friend just goes, you're not L.A. Yeah, you're New York. You're East Coast. Yeah. Like, I mean, I just yeah. think he said and they basically in closing, he said, when you have to make a decision and it's really, 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 really hard like this because you're weighing leaving a place like UConn, he basically said, I picked UConn. I didn't say no to the Lakers. Yeah, That's I mean, what he boiled it he down He obviously to. is the most famous person in Connecticut right now. Yeah, but being right. the most famous person in Connecticut, you can still hide. Yes, exactly. I exactly. lived there. I lived 30 minutes from stores. There's nothing there. Right, exactly. Literally nothing right. there. LA, you can't. <laughs> right. So, you know, like he's got enough money to do whatever he wants. He can have a nice quality of life living in stores, Connecticut, or wherever he is. Yeah. It TMZ is not following him around. Yes. You know, it's not every given moment. He's not going to be the pulse of like Stephen A. Smith Mm -hmm. every day. Like they don't even talk about UConn. They're the, they're the juggernaut. If you're the coach of the Lakers with LeBron James, you're the a topic every single day. day. And I wonder what his personality would deal with something like that. And I agree. He does not read LA to me. Yeah, exactly. Now, if the Celtics called him, right. Correct. Correct. I don't Cause, know. Cause I think that's what everyone's kind of insinuating, too, of he said, oh, you pick up the phone on the Lakers call. But, you know, there's probably a couple other franchises on the East Coast yeah. that he would pick up. You too. don't ignore that. You don't ignore them. You don't ignore the Knicks. Like, I think there's a couple well, franchises. Is, so. Hey, listen, he's the second guy. I mean, uh, Ben Johnson wouldn't leave yep. Detroit because he likes being there. Correct. Likes yep. being where he is. Doesn't want to do this. Hurley's different situation. He's in charge of that program. Yeah. They're winning big. Nobody wants to lose him. They'll give him as much money as they possibly can. They'll yep. give him as much security as he wants. It's all a matter of, do you want to do this? And he didn't. Right. So it sounds like J.J. Redick is at least back as a smokescreen or a real They're candidate. It's hard, it's hard to know yeah. how real it is. After this, it's hard to know how real it is, but maybe they will go that direction. Yeah. All right, we'll take a quick break. Brand Boston Show, ESPN 630 Sports Capital. Let's welcome in Spirit Defender Casey Kruger as the team gets set to take on San Diego this weekend out at Audi Field. Hey, Casey, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, I want to get into uh, the match in a moment, but I want to ask you about the national team because you were just there a couple of weeks ago uh, practicing once again, familiar place, obviously, for you. And I just want to see if you could just give us a state of the U.S. women's national program as the Olympics are set to begin in about a month. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, an interesting dynamic, you know, going in. Um, it was so nice to meet the, the staff the full coaching staff there's a lot of changes um and i think just the, collectively we thought it was just very refreshing to have that fresh start but also still bringing in um and continuing you know the previous culture that we had as well um so i think it was just you know a lot of new a lot of kind of figure out you know what to keep doing and then um a lot of figuring out like the tactics and um learning the way that emma wants to play um and then just having fun i think overall it was it was really great. It was we did a lot in, in just a week, um, and I think the performances were a really good start. That's really great. Um, obviously, the program has a legacy of a lot of championships and winning through the years. Um, can you kind of just give us a sense of where this team is on the world stage right now, from your viewpoint? Yeah, I think you know a lot of the world has has caught up for sure. Uh, um, They've shown that um, there's better resources, so competition's gotten better, um, and I think that's only a good thing. Um, just pushing the level forward, um, but I think not, you know, not to discredit us, like we're still very talented and very capable as well. So I think it's, you know, I think we're in a really good spot, um, but there's some room to go. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, you had three rookies that play with you on the spirit with you there as well. Um, can you kind of talk about their impact on this team and maybe what their futures look like internationally for the United States? Yeah, having three rookies from the spirit in camp, I think was just huge and just a testament to the talent of the group and um, how, how well the team has been performing this year and um, just collectively and as well as individually. And I think um, it was just really exciting to see performances get rewarded uh, so quickly. Uh, and it just shows, like, yeah, they may be young, but, like, they're ballers. And, uh, you know, it just doesn't matter. And it's just really cool to see and be rewarded for that. Um, the team, obviously the spirit is hot. You've won four matches in a row. Um, you guys have gotten off to really good starts in recent matches as well. What do you think the secret has been or, or what's been going on with the spirit to have all the success in recent weeks? That's a very good question. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of new, um, you know, with the coaching staff, a lot of really great young players. Um, and I think just and like eagerness to like, grow and learn as well so I, I don't think it's just one thing I think it's probably collectively all, all those things but just a huge credit to the coaching staff for um just having such a clear plan and how they want to play um and you know it's not been easy and there's still like a lot of room to grow but I think the group trajectory has been incredible so far and for you obviously this is new for you too here you've had a, a long established great career playing internationally and of course in the nwsl what was it about this opportunity that stood out to you that that you wanted to be part of the spirit i think so for me what drew me initially was just my conversations with mark i have a long history with mark just going back to college days and just you know deep trust in him and so i think the conversation started there um but you know, as I went and visited, and um, I obviously know, like, the talented roster uh, playing against them all the time in the NWSL. Um, just the more I learned, uh, the more I loved. Um, I spoke with Michelle, and it was just quite clear very quickly, like, how special she is and how special the club is and the vision that she has is just something I've never <laughs> heard of before, and it's just something I wanted to be a small part of. Um and then just of course the resources that this club has as well, uh, just as professional as you can get. Um, and I'm, I'm eager to grow and be in an environment where I can continue to grow as a player. Um, and I knew this was a place for me. Um, whatever you could share about it, when, when you say you heard things you had never heard before, um, what do you what do you mean by that? What, what what did they tell you? Just the level of detail, I would say that this club goes to, to make sure that we are successful. Um, just like the vision of, you know, the future and, and making this the best club in the world. Um, I'll just give like one example that the detail of, uh, like the female health side of things, like being treated as female athletes and not just male athletes. Um, uh, you know, stuff with like cycles and things like that. Like I, no other club has, done anything like that for me before and so just hearing that i was like okay like these people know what they're talking about they are going to do every little thing to you know make you successful on and off the table. uh let's talk about the match this weekend san diego has a very talented group of strikers obviously headlined by alex morgan who i'm sure you know really really well what is the challenge this weekend against san diego yeah san diego you know it's a very good team. They're very, very talented. They're tough to break down defensively. They just they don't they don't give us a lot of goals. Um, so I think that's you know going to be a challenge. But um, also like their attack, like you mentioned, they've got Alex, they've got Jay, they've got all these really great players, and then um, they're all very technical and really good. They're uh, sorry, very technical and good with the ball. And so I think you know defensively, um, it's going to be a challenge as well. All right. Last thing for you. Um, obviously, you've had this long storied career um, and the spirit is hopefully expecting a what could be a record crowd this weekend. You all are playing at Audi Field. I know that's new for you, but it, it, it it's you know, it's kind of new for the league and the team to have stadiums like this. What is your perspective on kind of the explosion of women's sports in general and women's soccer? I think it's been incredible to see. Um, I mean, it's it's a very exciting time to for women's sports to be a women's professional athlete, be a supporter of women's sports, uh, just all of the above. And I think we're just scratching the surface, to be honest. Um, but it's been so cool to see, you know, the growth just in my time of 
you know, just being in the league, um, where we started and where we are now and just where it's going to go. I'm just over the moon excited about it. Casey, good luck this weekend against San Diego. Good luck the rest of the season, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Sounds good. All right, that's Casey Kruger. All right, I'll give you a couple quick thoughts since we'll be calling the game, and you'll be able to hear it right here on ESPN 630. Kickoff set right at 730. So we're going to go on at 720, yep. give you a little pregame, 730 kickoff. Uh, I think the crowd's a big deal. They're probably going to have the biggest crowd they've ever had at Audi Field. They might even sell this thing out the way that it's tracking. So I'm very excited about that. I think we're going to have a great, mm-hmm. um, great night there with that. Um, I will say this, just having, you know, again, I'm starting to get a scout's eye on this differently now uh-huh. that I'm watching these games closely. This is going to be a tough one. Um, San Diego's very fast, very crafty up front. Morgan, Shaw, and Jones, yep. they're willing to pull them out, which they have in recent weeks. And Alex Morgan's had, actually had a lot of injuries this year. She, she typically isn't playing like 90 minutes anymore. Yep. So they're going to need to survive here. They're very fast. They're very quick. They're very good in the midfield, and their strikers are very dangerous. So uh, this is going to be about the back end for the Spirit to try to keep them out of the net because uh, San Diego, while they're not scoring a lot, they've had a million chances recently, and it's just not going in. That may change tomorrow. So I think the Spears are going to have to score two, three goals to win. Sure. That's what I think right. tomorrow. And that's going to be hard-pressed to do against a very good defensive team. And hopefully they don't get behind here because the energy, if San Diego plays the way they did the last couple of weeks, they're going to bring a lot of energy and they could score quickly. So the back end is going to be very important for the Spirit tomorrow. The good part is because I just kind of look at the team, um, how they've come out in the last three or four games. And, you know, I think talked to you off the air last year last week about how you know what they've had kind of these weird things where they've it's almost like the caps they've let in last second goals at the end of halves or at the last minute of the game that ultimately don't matter in the end with the result but they're they've like almost let up a little bit in some of these games Mm -hmm. I think last week there was a perfect kind of like wake up call for them that they had to score one goal and grind out the rest of the game essentially like I'm at least that was a poor team that they played last week and they took advantage of it and they mixed around their lineup a little bit I think they rested some people off a weird week and they got tired legs too they got the one goal that they needed and they were able to sit on it that's not going to be the case tomorrow right and and what I'm getting at is I think though last week is a good wake up call for anyone that roster that thought they can just kind of show up and score four goals like they've done the last couple games we played besides last week so i will say at least the wake-up call probably happened last week and they're going to take this one a little bit more seriously than before i uh, referenced this earlier but uh today a clip from the second night of the draft was put out of the phone call between adam peters and howie roseman of the eagles when they uh, consummated a trade that had washington move down philadelphia took cooper DeGene out of iowa And then Washington gathered more draft capital in the second and third round and made the picks that they made. And at the end of this clip, Adam Peters calls Howie Roseman a pain in the ass. And you hear him say this because it sounds like Roseman tried to do an okie doke and change the numbers of picks along the way. And Peters like caught him in it and made him commit to the ones that they actually wanted. As we welcome in John Kime from ESPN, John Kime Report. I'll say yeah. this for you both because I don't know if Kime has been on this phone, but uh, uh, Jaden did just sign his rookie contract. Oh, he did. Just letting you know that. Four years, 37.75, fully guaranteed. Great. Just having a minute ago. Fully guaranteed. Yep. Uh, okay, yep. great. Four years, but they'll have a fifth year option on him, right? I yeah, believe I so. so. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I believe so. All right, so we'll get into that in a second. They, yeah, go ahead. They will have the fifth year option, yes. Okay. That's always the first. But yes, he, he is signed, signed and done. And never going to expect you know, hold out for sure, but. He's done. Yeah. Four years, 37 million guaranteed. Guaranteed is actually not normal, but at that number for what he is, it's, I suppose, an easy choice to make if that's what they're demanding, which clearly his side was demanding that they wanted that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, it's, yes. And, and it's also like everything, usually with the, with the first, with the high picks, the, the battle is over. Like, how much of the bonus and when you get the bonus and how is it split up, you know? So there, there are different times and ways you can structure that. And then, um, you know, um, vo- not the void of the offsets track. So like, yeah, but the fully guaranteed means you're getting all the money. So, right. And, no and it, right. And at that price, I mean, that's in these, this day and age, especially if you're Trevor Lawrence, that's nothing for a quarterback. So, right. so they're in <laughs> right. the right spot with him. All right. So they get that one done. I want to go back to this the little clip here. I do hope one day, John, that other GMs think Adam Peters is a pain in the ass and tough to deal with, too. I, I hope that that's the case. <laughs> oh, yeah, and that was kind of cool. And, you know, listen, they that stuff doesn't get played 
if the Eagles aren't okay with having that out there too. Yeah. And I think Howie Roseman is very okay with letting people know that letting his fan base know that he's trying to, you know, how he's trying to maneuver things and that he is a pain in the ass. Like that's, you know, so yeah, no, that was, that was kind of, that was, that was funny. Uh, he's not, <laughs> I would say this. That's not the only time I've heard that about Howie Roseman. Well, he's a wheeler dealer and he gets it done and often dealing with him doesn't work out for you. So, you know, that it's always an interesting yeah, choice when I, you give him what he wants. That's for sure. I, I think, I think he can be like, I think the word is that he can be a very tough guy to work for. He's very, very good at his job. Yes, he is. Uh, we reached a milestone yesterday. It's the end of the off season, if you will, with the end of mini camp. The team breaks. They'll be back sometime at the end of July to start training camp. Obviously, this is all new, um, new everything. So as we've reached this point and they break, what has stood out to you about the first off season program under? <clears throat> Adam Peters, Dan Quinn, and this new team that they have? I think just, I think people are probably going to get tired of hearing the word energy, but that is what's different. And, um, I, you know, just with change comes different energy, right? And I think you're always going to get something like that whenever you have a change and everything. It's just been more pronounced than, than I can remember. And, um, you know what I mean? And so I think like that's a big deal. And it's just it permeates throughout the building. It's all over the place. And it's, you know, part of it is because they have so many, so many um, former players who are coaches. Like that is, um, you know, a big deal. Right. And I think, so I think, I think that's a lot of it. People like players are excited to be here and be part of this. And, that feels genuine and you can see the looks on the faces of the guys who've been around for a couple of years and how, how, in, how reinvigorated they seem to be. So I think more than anything, that to me is what has stood out. Like the stuff on the field, we still don't know where it's going to go this year, but I think the other aspects are what help you build something for the long-term success. Short term, who the hell knows? Because there's still a lot of questions on this roster. But long term, I think they've they've really done a good job laying the foundation. Okay, uh, so they signed Daniels, and we're at this point. I know you're tired of talking about this, but what have you seen throughout the course of the spring through the mini camp in his development? Oh, it's the first time I've been asked that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, I would say this: it's fun to talk about that, right? You know, so because I think when there's a new quarterback like this. Like, I enjoy talking about quarterbacks, and especially when you have a guy that's this talented, right? Because, like, I think it's going to be fun to watch his development. So I could talk all day about what we've seen on him and not get tired of it because I think there's a lot to see. So I think what you and, – and really, like, on the field, you see the stuff that they like. You know, like, you see how he's able to – Um, and you and I have talked about this, how he's decisive out there for the most part. I mean, there's sometimes you're going to get crossed up, but for the most part, he's decisive. He's for the most part, very accurate. Um, and you know, um, you see the, the touch and the, the act, you know, again, accuracy on the, on the ball and he throws with, doesn't have a cannon, but he has a good arm. And, um, so I think you see all that, but I think to me, the best, stuff is what you hear because what you hear are the kind of things that he does that the really really good quarterbacks have to do and doesn't guarantee he's going to be one but if he didn't do this stuff I would just say this we've seen that a few times here where quarterbacks don't do the stuff he's doing and we see how it turns out so you know you know getting there early and going out watching film and doing little walkthroughs in the bubble um the you know like that's a big deal his his personality and he's not forcing the leadership role onto himself and nor are they forcing it on him either but i think he has a naturally engaging personality not like he's mr effervescent and just like the you know the loudest guy in the room or anything like that that's not him um he's actually re- relatively quiet until from where people i talk to him get to know him right so i think like but I think there's a, but I also think like if you're, if you're a team leader, a guy like, you know, Jeremy Reeves, you know, a Bobby Wagner, guys like that, 
who have been around the game a while and you see a guy come in like this, I think you like it. And the, you know, the brain of a lot of the, the, you know, of Wagner, he picked the brain of Jeremy Reeves, of, you know, Zach Ertz is always talking to him. So like Marcus Mariota, I've heard has been very good with him. So I think all that stuff to me matters way more than what we've seen on the field. Now, if we saw bad stuff, that would be, that would be trouble that he's doing all this stuff and you're not seeing anything, but you do see it. But the field stuff will know more in August and, and obviously the fall, but the other stuff, again, just like the, the, just like the organization, what his approach is more for a long-term success than immediate. Success. Yeah. I, 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 than I, just immediate success, I should say. Yeah. I agree with you on the, the thing that's really stood out to me. And this is the only thing I can really look at on the field um, because just by the nature of the way they practice and what the rules are in practicing, you're not seeing football like at the speed that you're going to see it with no. hitting or him any threat of being hit because of the way that the practices are structured by rule and that nobody wants to get hurt anyway. And so what I haven't seen yet and what I want to know is at real time, real speed, what are his instincts? Because we know what he's capable of, but we, we haven't been given the opportunity to see it. Like, will he vacate a pocket earlier because of his legs, because of the speed of the game? Will he not and stay through progressions? Will he make the decisions as fast as he's making them in seven on seven when it's 11 on 11 and you're being chased by Micah Parsons? I don't know. So that's the part that still is a major mystery to me and is hard. Like when people ask, like, how's he look? I'm like, well, he looks good, but he's not doing a lot of the things that I think we all need to see to know really where he is right now. Right. And that's why, that's why I harp on, the other stuff, because the other stuff will help to what you're talking about. Um, when? Don't know, because some of that's going to be dependent on playing. It's going to depend on, on roster. Like, in, you know, are you able to get rid of the – get no quicker or whatever, or are they keeping stuff open? Or, like you said, like, what it, you know, how quickly are you going through your progression? That, that can take time. You don't just come in and just boom right away. At least most guys do not. I mean – C.J. Stroud did a really good job last year, but, you know, that's, he's more the exception than the rule as far as high picks or any quarterback coming in and doing that. So I, that you're right. Like, you know, even Austin Eckler was like a lot of guys, like they've been singing his praises, but he's like, you know, until you get to the preseason, you don't really know anything, but they are very proud of where he's at. Yeah. And I think that's the best way to sum it up because I think that's accurate. You know, a lot of good signs. But again, I think for long-term growth, you have to see and hear the other stuff. I agree. Whatever was the field, that's good. And you're right. Like this is this is seven on seven, and then you know, you're you're not. There's no threat of being hit. Now the other, conversely, we're not going to see how much he incorporates his legs, either. Right? We haven't. That. And so how is that going to look and how is that going to change a defense? How will that change how they play him? Um, so I think those things are interesting to see too, but yeah, there's a long way to go. I would just say it's a really good start for laying the foundation of, of building his game. Um, the other day, Terry McLaurin met with the media, spoke for 20 minutes, and it was the first time that he has spoken really at length, you know, since all of the change has come in. And I was very curious to hear what he would say about what's happening here, what his career has been to this point, you know, to what degree he's already trying to connect with Daniels, who's clearly the future of the position for them. What was your takeaway from from listening to McLaurin the other day? Terry McLaurin is excited for this season and for the changes. That was my takeaway. And you can dealt with him since, what, 2019? I talked to, you know, every Wednesday we're talking to him, talked to him a lot in the locker room. I don't know that I've seen him this excited about this. And whether it's Daniels, and he even said, like, he's never had a young quarterback who has gone up to him at practice, like, hey, let's work on this rep. Let's work on this route, whatever. And you hear, like, McLaurin has said that, Eckler has said that you know, about Daniel. So I think like that's a big deal. I think that overall change is a big deal for him. He looked happy. And Terry, he almost always looks happy, right? He's never a guy who's just like, well, 
Well, there were a couple times last year, but there, but he's not like a, you know, it's not like he was. It was just like the this massive change, but you could see it, right? I mean, he definitely had. Um, he definitely seemed like he was reinvigorated uh, by by the changes, by the addition of Daniels, et cetera. So I think I think that's you know, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think he's in a good spot because of this. And he talked for he talked Bram. He talked for like twenty one, twenty two minutes in the spring, which just doesn't happen. Yeah. I think that's indicative of him giving. He likes to. He gives long answers anyway but he's going even a little bit longer on some of these topics because I think he's just kind of excited. So he's their clear number one receiver, and and that's not in question here. But, you know, you know how this goes. Like, with a young quarterback, you typically time it up with your number one receiver being somewhere in the same age range, and that's, that's going to be interesting to watch here um, as we move down the road here. Does he remain the primary target? Is he the number clear number one and the clear number one that is going to be on a three- to five-year run where you hope that Daniels is going to emerge and be the type of quarterback and they can have the type of offense that they're looking at. Have you kind of thought about him this year and what it means, you know, not for necessarily his future, but what exactly his standing is as, like, the top receiver as they kind of transition over to Daniels and Kingsbury? I haven't thought a lot about it because there's nobody on the roster that I would say is going to usurp him at this point. You know, I know last year going into last year, a few of us wondered would where, what would Jahan Dotson do as that regard, in that regard. I think Dotson can be more productive than he was last year. Have some more bigger plays. I just think until he until he gets off the line more consistently against press coverage and becomes a be- bigger threat against that kind of coverage, I think it's going to be hard for him to ascend to a role where McLaurin is at. Um, but yeah, I mean. You know, McLaurin's contract is up after the 2025 season. So you're, and at that point, what, he'll be, what, 30? Yes. So you're going to wonder at that point, what do you do? Because where receiver salaries are going, you know, could you see them drafting a guy next ring? Of course. You know, but, um, and he right now, I think, I think right now in 2025, Five, he has a seventh highest cap hit. But there's also probably there's a handful. There's a few guys who will surpass him once they sign their deals, like C.D. Lamb, Brendan Ayuk, T. Higgins. Like once their deals are done, like then they'll surpass him in that. So he'd be what tenth or so. You know, is he? How much are you going to pay for a guy who's in his thirties? But see where it is too. Like you're getting two full seasons to measure his how he works with. Um, Daniels as well and so um, but yeah I know you're I mean it'd be it wouldn't shock me if next year they get somebody I mean oh you know they don't have great depth at that position so I think you're going to have to do something there anyway and could that be the guy that ultimately replaces McLaurin sure yeah I mean it, you know again he'd be a 30 30 plus receiver how much are you willing to pay and especially because then a couple years later you're going to be paying this guy you know, That's so, right. um, you know, but, but yeah, I, I, but yeah, right. Like I said, though, right now there's nobody on the roster that I say is going to pass yeah. him. Yeah, I agree. All right. Let me talk about the defense with you for a minute. Um, here's a couple of names that really stood out and they were name checked big time by Quinn, especially yesterday as he was breaking camp. One was Quan Martin and the other was Jeremy Chin who have, you know, if you're going to take, you know, something off of the field and I agree with you, it's hard to know a lot. Those two have stood out. Big time, like Chin with how vocal he is, the versatility of positions. I saw him playing single high. I saw him in the box. I saw him moving around. He totally looks the part. And then Martin, who seems to be around the ball a lot and is someone that the coaches are like glowing about as a movable part who could be a dangerous player for them. Those were the two that really stood out to me that I think have made a real major impact and could be huge impact players for Witt and Quinn this, this fall. Well, I'm a big Quan Martin fan based on even how he finished last year. His last couple of games were very solid. And I, his versatility and smarts I felt like showed in some of those games, like San Francisco game, for example, in that game, he covered at different times. It was Ayuk, Kittle and McCaffrey. And in each case, 
he did very well. Like that's really hard to do for a young. I mean, he's a, he's a safety slash slot corner, and you know, for him to be able to do that, like, and I remember even talking to him one time about McCaffrey and how he handled a particular route. And he's like, I knew he wanted to go inside, so I just had to like. He usually gets guys to get their feet going and all that. And he's like, I just stayed and held, you know, basically held my maintain my leverage, and it forced him to go outside, and the ball had to go elsewhere. So my point is like, he's a smart kid who has versatility, and and he showed that at the end of the year. Then you're going to pair him with this group, I think, that's going to highlight probably even more of what he can do and just a natural development. And Quinn, you know, Dan Quinn talks a lot about guys who can take the ball away. We saw, we saw Martin do that in practice a couple of times with the one behind the back interception. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I'm not surprised that, that they, how much they like him, but because I just think the kid can play. And so that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, he, again, the smarts and the versatility fits what they want to do. And Chin, even more so because of the size, like you look at the safeties that – that Quinn seems to like. I mean, look at the guys they they brought in. Chin. He's like he's what is he six two six three two twenty or something like that. Yeah, he's um, imposing Dom- looking back there. He's really yeah. imposing. I mean, yeah. I mean, and um, Dominique Hampton, big guy. You know, um, Tyler Owens, an undrafted free agent. One of their they they gave a for an undrafted free agent. He got a really good deal, which tells you how much they like him. He's a big dude. He's like six two two fifteen something like that. That you know, so he's got he has good size as well. It allows them to bring him down in the box, and I think that's so that that's something that that is definitely notable. But Chin gives you that, and did not not coming off his best year in Carolina. I think there's some people there who weren't sure really why it was like that, but it was. But before that, he was you know he showed a lot of what he could do, and I think I'll be I'm really curious to see how he how he bounces back in this system but yes he's a guy that you know it's funny too Brad because during free agency two of the names that stood out when you'd ask people about what they thought about what Washington did I mean see Bobby Wagner's at a certain point but like the number one guy that people would talk about was Luvu and one of the other guys they say and I really love the chin side yeah so I do I think too he's definitely going to give you something yep. yeah he's versatile and he he's completely vocal on the field he's one of the players you hear out there he's really all in on this well um, let's yeah. talk about that can we talk about that for a second yeah because to me you go back to what has stood out this spring I think the communication has jumped out you know in a big way like you hear so much more now working against a lot of no huddle and hurry up, I think promotes the communication on the D, but you hear it a lot out there and you didn't always hear that in the past. Yeah. And the other thing that really just stood out too, with with just watching Quinn and it's hard to compare coaches, but he's just like actively involved in the reps. Like, and you see that over and over and over and you know, like Ron really delegated a lot of it to his assistant coaches yeah. and kind of stood back and he got involved at times, but really kind of stood back and kind of oversaw the whole thing. That's not what you see with Quinn. Like he's a very energetic guy and he's literally hands on in the plays, standing in the huddles, watching players coaching on the fly. It's, it's hard not to see it. Well, it, I think like even with the huddle stuff, he's listening to what, how Jaden Daniels calls the plays in the huddle to make sure how is he developing there? Because not a lot. That's not something that a lot of college quarterbacks do anymore. But the other, to your point, like what, you know, if you if you watch them on kickoff return when they're working on kick cover or kick returns, he's back there talking to the returners and you know oftentimes like kind of like motioning to how they want them to cut or when or just the angles or whatever, and then he's trailing them on the play. So like that. Now I will say, <laughs> you know. You and I go back. You go back to Carlisle with Marty Schottenheimer showing Daryl Green how to field a punt. Yeah. That didn't go over too well. Yeah, but he's yeah. not. He's not doing that. But he is like this is a new thing. But it is. It does highlight how he's involved. And you know the one. The hard part for Rivera because I do remember talking to guys at the time. But first of all, when you have he had the cancer and that took a lot out of him. Yeah, yeah. So I think I don't know if that was because like, I heard that he was a little bit more like that in Carolina. But he wasn't like that here. And how much it was that versus just like you, you're, you know, relying too much on the assistance. But it definitely is noticeable. All right, last thing. Um, just your thoughts on Jamin Davis as they appear to want to try to take a shot with him 
as an edge rusher, stand-up edge rusher, uh, pass rusher? Like, how are you kind of seeing how they're thinking about him as he heads into what is a contract year? So early on in, in the OTAs, it was during seven on sevens he played linebacker, and then, um, but he'd also like in pre, in some early drills, he was definitely doing. He used a lot of time with the edge guys, just you know, pass rush stuff. Last week, it was almost exclusively as a lineman, as an, as an edge, on the edge. Whether he's two-point, sometimes a three-point, whatever. So that, you know, he definitely has the athleticism. I did see him turn the corner one time on a, on a tackle, and it was, you know, it was Braden Daniels who, who has struggled last year. So, but, it, but you do, like, you see that he can bend a little bit. You know, he's not Von Miller bending in the corner, but you, you know he has some of that flexibility. Um, I think there's still a lot for him to learn, which is why I think you need to get – if you're going to try him there, you need to give him a chance, which means give him a lot of reps there. So even in – now I've seen him in some drills where it's like coaches seem to be very pleased about some of the footwork or the angles that he's taking. But then you see him other times like – again – let me say this. It's really hard to know until you put pads on with rushers and, and linemen. It's just, it's really hard. But what you, but you can't like if a guy, but if, but if a guy's never winning on a, on his rep, then you, you have to say, okay, what's he doing and where's this going? Um, I think with him, it's so early that it's like, you see things and like, okay, going to have to learn how to do this, going to have to learn how to do that. Um, but he has for a, for a linebacker, he has good length. And he's athletic, so that gives him a, ch- a good starting point right there. But he's going to have to learn, like, you know, where to – how to basically divide the body of a tackle, where to attack, right? How do you – you know what I mean? And how to use your hands when you're coming off the line. And things like that, like, that takes a minute to learn. So – but they certainly – but they do look like they're going to give him a lot of chances there. All right. Uh, have a good summer, John. I don't know if you're doing anything fun, yeah. but enjoy it. And I'll see you at training camp uh, at the end of July. Awesome. Looking forward to it. All right. That's John Kime from ESPN and the John Kime Report. Take a quick break. We'll be right back. Brain Watch the Show, ESPN 630, the Sports Capital.